I feel like we're kind of in this position because of Corona in the first place to be afforded the opportunity anyway. So it makes me laugh that um, Corona is going to swoop in at the last second and disturb the whole thing again. So, um, but look, you can't control it. So the only way to look at it is, is with positivity. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Western Australia has been relatively sheltered from the COVID-19 pandemic thanks to strict border closures and restrictions. But in an instant, a person with the virus spent a few days in the community and the state has been sent into a five-day lockdown. What sort of impact will this have on local hospitality venues? And what landscape is it painting for the foreseeable future? Chris Howard is a co-owner of The Humble Onion in Perth, Western Australia. Chris, how are you going? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. You were literally 17 hours away from opening your very first venue. Um, what, what's it like over there at the moment? Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's very, very fresh at the moment. Um, and when we're sat in the CBD right now, um, I'm quite surprised to sort of see quite a few people um, whilst wearing masks and everything out on the street. It's not, not quite the same ghost town that we had um, 11 mm. months ago. But um, I think everyone's still at the stage of just trying to get all their um, all their supplies and all their things home and, and that sort of thing. We've got a Woolworths here at the, the base of NX100, the building that we're in front of, and there was a, a long line out the front of that when we arrived this morning wow. um, to keep packing down the venue. So, um, yeah, I think people are just, um, you know, they're, they're, they're still scared. And I think most of them just want to stay home, so they need provisions to be able to do that, you know. Western Australia has had very few cases and been pretty um, virus free for quite a while. What's it, what's it felt like um, having this news in the last couple of days? Yeah, I, th- I think we went um, 10 months without a single um, recorded wow. case. Um, so, you know, the feeling really was that we were kind of just over Corona. Um, it was a, a thing in the news that was happening in, in a different world, you know. Um, so it certainly reminds you of how vulnerable we always are. Um, but as well, I, I think Really, it's certainly the feeling, I guess you always see what you're looking for, but the feeling that we're trying to project um, is that we, we've done this before and um, we know exactly what we have to do to get through it as quick as possible. I think we only were at such a stage of, um, say, freedom um, because we were so isolated and because we just shut down so quickly the first time. So mm-hmm. this is a very preemptive measure um, from, from McGowan um, and uh, and we, we support it wholly because I'd much rather close for a week and just delay our plans than, um, than have this thing sort of spiral out of control again. You were set to open uh, today. It's Monday at the moment. Uh, how do you feel about having that delay? Were you ready to open or is it a bit of a breath of fresh air to have an extra week? Um, we were we were very ready. Um, it's, it's a bit, uh, not that I've ever been a, a boxer or a fighter or anything myself, but you, know, you really <laughs> get yourself very psyched up. Um, and it was, it's been a, a really intense, um, six weeks, uh, in the lead up to this. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you just kind of laugh because there's not where, where I feel like we're kind of in this position because of Corona in the first place, um, to be afforded the opportunity anyway. So it, it almost feels just kind of, I don't want to say fitting, but, but certainly it makes me laugh that, um, Corona is going to swoop in at the last second and, um, <laughs> and disturb the whole thing again. So. Um, but look, you can't control it. So the only way to look at it is is with positivity. You know, more time to prep and more time to um, to sleep certainly isn't a bad thing. But um, yeah, we should be three hours into our first service by now. Well, as you mentioned, it's come about from the circumstances of the pandemic. Can you tell us about the Humble Onion and how it began? Sure. Um, so the Humble Onion uh, is a name that I've probably said to I don't know how many chefs across the country now. Um, over the last several years. Um, It's always a name I've had for a venue. But um, I was looking at getting together a um, kind of a catering business and I wanted to start doing events and and pop-ups and things under my own brand. Um, And then when, and that was going to be at the start of last year. Um, And then when the pandemic hit, um, I decided to, to take that all the, all the stuff I'd laid out and all the plans I had and, and basically just that I was excited for it um, and use that um, for a, a channel for cooking videos and for a platform that I thought, well, you know, if we can build a base through this time, then afterwards we can look at 
um, going out and then doing live events and, and you know it can sort of um, all come together um, so the, the humble onion in its infancy was um, was a YouTube and Instagram account where I wow. was making videos um, at home and um, and teaching people to cook from from my own kitchen you mentioned that it's, it was a name that you've had for a long time and you've bugged lots of chefs over your career with that name. What's, <laughs> what's, where did it come from? Um, I, I have an onion tattoo on my, my right forearm <laughs> and that was one of my, one of my first tattoos. And um, I think the, it's, it's wonderful because, again, sort of in the infancy of my cooking career, um, I always gravitated towards, um, you know, sort of the St. John with, you know, Fergus has always been a real idol in my mind, um, sort of mentality of, of not, there's, there's no bad ingredients, there's just bad execution. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. So, um, you know, the onion to me was always kind of a, a symbol of that, um, that, you know, to, to sort of have a bite out of a raw onion would be pretty dreadful. I'm, I'm fairly certain I can't say I've ever done it myself. Um, you know, but when you treat onions well, I think they just, they shine at least as well as because you're always going to pair, you know, your Wagyu steak with onions. You know, it's it's having those things alongside. It's um, mm. onions, the, the leek and longestine terrine from Marco Pierre White, you know, that, that classic um, pairing of the, the highbrow with the lowbrow. Um, and so I think that's that's something that's only strengthened in my philosophy as I've moved forward in cooking. And, and it makes me very happy that I did that early on because um, – most of the decisions I made when I was 22 have, have not worked out so well. So <laughs> it's nice to have a tattoo that's aged well with me instead of the opposite. Uh, you trained in Perth at the greenhouse with uh, Matt Stone. Can you take us back to those early stages of your career? What was that like? Sure, yeah. Um, my um, the, the first cooking job um, that I had was out um, in the hills at a little winery. Um, which I applied for just from Seek. It was between that and Feral Brewery, I remember. Um, and luckily they called me back first. <laughs> um, and that was our working for the Osborne family. And, and I think that that's where I sort of fell in love with hospitality um, because the, the family lived on site. Um, it was um, Andy and Michelle and their three boys. And I really felt a strong connection to working for someone who was working there every day and seeing how hard they worked and how much they invested really I found that very, very inspiring. Um, but as far as the actual product we're making, you know, when you're when you're brand new, you don't really know. I, I wasn't very accustomed to going out to a lot of restaurants or anything like that, so I, I didn't really know what the good food was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so I'll sort of leave it there for for the <laughs> chef's sake. But um, but um, I, I went to TAFE um, with a guy Simon Kruger who was working here at the greenhouse and. Um, he, we just got on really, really well at, um, at TAFE and we'd always work together and, and do all our little projects together and stuff. And we'd always take it way further than the briefing. So, you know, we'd, we'd always be trying to scrounge extra ingredients and, and build these really elaborate dishes when we were just supposed to execute something pretty straightforward. And then um, when a position came up here, he sort of said, look, you should come and work with us. Um, and, uh, you know, I had this image in my head of just this crazy laboratory kind of place, you know, where there's this, this elusive stony guy who's in the corner like a, a mad scientist or something. Um, and uh, to walk in the first time, and, and that was coming through the same NX building that I walk through every day now. And um, I walk in, there's, there's plants all over the outside, and the smell of the wood fire oven when I first came through the doors was just everything I, I, I'll, I'll never forget and Matt was standing at the pass and um, he's plating a, a cabbage and radish salad um, into a plant pot um, <laughs> and uh, I remember that salad had an awesome allspice dressing and um, he was probably wondering why I was staring at him like a weirdo but um, <laughs> we, um, I went out the back with, with Courtney Gibb um, who was the then sous chef who, who ended up running the place um, and we're on a milk crate and he was just like, you know, Simon says you're all right. Do you want to start? And that was it. You know, there was no, um, no real trial or anything. So I always felt a very strong, um, sense of responsibility to Simon to make sure that I, you know, didn't stuff it up because, you know, I always felt like he kind of put his neck on the line for, for me to have an opportunity. Um, when I'd just been working at this kind of 
Um, they, they didn't know the winery, you know. Um, it's not like I came from anywhere with a, a reputation. So I always wanted to make sure that I achieved higher than, than what everyone expected. But um, whilst I'd say that um, Darlington, the, the winery, was, was where I fell in love with hospitality, um, mm. the, the greenhouse kitchen was where I sort of feel like I really started chefing. And that was where I really understood um, just so many more techniques and so much exposure to different ingredients. I mean, the chefs that we had in the kitchen were just amazing, you know. Um, it was a, a real community, and, you know, some really great healthy competition. And, um, yeah, it, it was a real band of brothers. It was absolutely wonderful. You worked at um, many venues in Perth, but you also ventured to Tasmania and Melbourne. What's been some of the real big influences in your career working in those different venues that you've been at? Um, yeah, my, my time in Tasmania, um, I look back on as with incredible fondness. Um, I, I was working um, at Cantina 663 in Mount Lawley um, at the time, and I'd been promoted to head chef, but I feel like really I was just kind of the, the strongest cook that did the ordering. I, I wasn't a leader, and I, I certainly wasn't a manager. Mm. And um, I, was, I was partying way too much, and I was very concerned with my ego and, and all the wrong things. So... I just looked for jobs that were basically as far away from where I was as possible within Australia. Um, so I looked at the east coast of Tasmania, and I think it was a job maybe on Lizard Island or something um, in North Queensland. Um, and a bit like Darlington, they, they just got back to me first. <laughs> um, so life can be very serendipitous sometimes. But um, So I, I was like just on the phone and, and took the job, and I was like, cool, I'll be there you know, in a few weeks, and, and that was that. Um, and then I started looking at this place that I was calling Freysenet, um, which is the, <laughs> the Freysenet National Park. Um, arriving in Tasmania was just insane. I'll, I'll never forget the as you step off the tarmac at um, Hobart Airport. I'm not sure if it's the same now, but um, you're not actually in a terminal. You step out actually on the, the tarmac itself. And the air in Tasmania just feels different. It's amazing mm. when you, you step out. It's it's thinner and it feels cleaner. It's it's like drinking bottled water. It's um it's really amazing. Um and uh, I I picked up my car and, and didn't even have to go into Hobart at all. The the airport's north of Hobart and started heading up the east coast. And um straight away just the feeling of freedom and of being just it, it's it's wilderness. You know it, it's it's so beautiful um, and pure. Uh, it was just absolutely amazing. And then to combine that with working um, at Sapphire, which is a, a super luxe hotel, mm. um, very small team, um, but very, very just amazing product and amazing standard. Um, the executive chef there, Hugh Whitehouse, had Dali's. Um, back mm. in his day, he was a two-hat chef and, and had brought um, and had trained right through um, Switzerland. And, you know, he brought a lot of his team with him. Um, and that was where I really got an understanding that, you know, it, it wasn't about just cooking harder than everyone else. It wasn't just about, um, you know, I can do 18 hours, you can't, therefore I'm, I'm a step ahead or that's why I'm in charge or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was when the head chef sat down with me and he was like, I, um, Simon, and, and said, you know, I'm not the best cook in the kitchen but I am the manager. I am the best person to manage the kitchen. And that was a whole different world to me because it, um, both, you know, between Greenhouse, um, El Publico, Cantina, you know, all I saw was head chefs working to the absolute extreme of, of their capabilities. Um, and that, that's what I thought a head chef did. I thought you were supposed to be the, the sergeant that was kind of over the trenches first sort of thing, you know, um, and to, to really be able to see that, no, it's actually about things running smoothly. It's about things being um, mm. very much under control and very well managed that uh, that really opened my perspective. Um, and, I mean, the ingredients we had access to in that venue was just insane. There was no no limit to anything between Robins Island Wagyu and, and things that just, just blew my mind. Um, and then, you know, the... To be juxtaposed against um, a fisherman that would literally go out and just catch the fish for us and bring them straight to us. Wow. You know, so, you know, you, you're dealing with two completely opposite ends of the spectrum that you put together seamlessly. Um, you know, so that was just absolutely amazing. 
and we would be out diving and fishing before work and you know spend the weekends just um, outdoors you know so the access to produce was just like nothing I've ever experienced and it's it's very un um, I don't want to say unfarmable. Uh, it's, it's, you just can't manufacture um, that kind of authenticity. Um, mm. and I, I think in this day and age especially, it's it's very, very hard to find things that are authentic. And, man, if Tasmania is anything, it's, it's definitely authentic. Sapphire is a world away from a place like Town Mouse in Melbourne, which is no longer there, but you spent some time in that kitchen. How, how different was that experience? Yeah, again, they're all, um, I think they all sort of came at the right time and they were all um, not not opposing, but they're all sort of different parts of a puzzle. Um, so I I was a sous chef at um, Sapphire and um, my, my good friend Charlie had, had just been constantly trying to get me up to Melbourne. And um, I'd gone and seen him a couple of times, but I, I was always pretty hesitant. I lived in a this house on the beach, um, it was 250 bucks a week for this, this amazing house that overlooked Great Oyster Bay. Wow. Um, it's still, still the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, and I had my, my little veggie garden and my, my little ute, and I was, I was pretty contented. Um, but I, I sort of felt that I was starting to fall behind where I wanted to, to be going um, as far as my, you know, I was just getting a bit lax, and I, I didn't want to fall into a routine um, like I was living on holiday or something. So that was my mentality anyway. Um, so I, I, I finally, he was like, look, there's a position opening up at the town house. Um, you should, you should go for it. So I was like, fine. <laughs> so, um, spoke to, um, spoke to Dave and, and everything was all good and, and went up there and did a trial on the weekend and came home and was like, okay, I'm, I'm leaving. So packed up all my stuff and go to the house, which was obviously a very, very easy thing to find someone to take over the lease of, <laughs> um, and uh, sold my ute to my apprentice for, for no money whatsoever and packed all my stuff up and, and was just there you know, a couple of weeks later. And then on my first day in the kitchen, um, at the end of service, um, they call everyone uh, together and they're like, we just want to let you know um, that the venue is up for sale. And wow. I was just, I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh my God, I've just made this huge move and this huge transition. <laughs> um, and this is what's happened. Um, and I mean, they, they were fantastic. And they said, you know, this, this wasn't planned. And, and David said, you know, there's a spotted ambler if you'd like to move there afterwards and all those things. But I'd sort of come up to try to um, do my time there um, in a way that I've seen so many other chefs that have gone on to incredible things through those kitchens, um, through, through Dave and, and Christian's venues, um, you know, I, I wanted that experience. So, um, yeah, that, that was, was definitely um, a shock. But um, as far as the, the running of the kitchen um, and the running of service, you know, I'd never seen anything like that before. And the, the front of house team especially, they were incredible, you know, like they, they were just absolute weapons. And I'd always kind of been used to, um, I mean, from remote Tasmania and, and just Perth sort of um, 10 years ago, very, very hard to find people that were career front of house mm. um, minded, you know, that, that really wanted to, to take it all the way. Um, it was generally the job that people were doing until their real life started. Um, and that was always something that's very hard in the kitchen because, you know, this is kind of what I want to be when I grow up. So, um, yeah, but those those girls were just incredible. They were absolutely amazing, terrifying. <laughs> so that was that was great. Um, and then to see how how tight things can be run, you know, that everything was so specific um, that there was just no need for excess. There was no fat. Um, and that was really, really wonderful. So, yeah, I love spending time there with, um, especially with Jasper. He's, he's a really, really fantastic chef. Mm. Um, and, uh, and seeing the ideas that he come up with, we'd have, um, uh, every Sunday, I think it was Sunday, um, once a week, we'd, um, we'd all have to put up a dish and talk about it, try to get those kind of projects and, and those sort of things flowing. And, you know, it was, um, was really incredible to see what other chefs in that kitchen would put up and, and the way that their minds worked. Um, and I learned a lot, a hell of a lot about, um, the application of sourness and seasoning and, and the complexity of, um, you know, adding culture to almost everything that we did. Um, and yet those things were, were absolutely wonderful. And it's definitely things I've carried with me. 
You mentioned while you were head chef at Cantina 663 that you didn't feel like you were a leader or a very good manager, but now you've got your own venue. What's changed since those days to lead you in this direction? Yeah, well, I mean, um, six or seven years is probably uh, one of the things. But, um, you know, I think then I was very much focused on going up. That's what I thought was important was because, I, you know, when I worked at, um, when I worked at Greenhouse, um, Matt Stone was Best Young Chef Gourmet Traveller. And then I moved to El Publico and that opened and then Sam Ward, Best Young Chef Gourmet Traveller. You know, and I saw these kind of guys that I really idolised and thought, man, that's – and there was so much focus put on that in the media – um, that you have to be the hot young talent, the best young, the best new. Um, that I really was like, man, if I miss this boat, my career's just gone. You know, and I really thought that that was the case back then, um, which certainly isn't a view that I share anymore. But um, you know, that 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 I put a lot of pressure on myself in that respect. So I always thought about it's it's about jumping over the person in front of you. So. Um, when I got to head chef, I was like, this is it. This is, you know, this is where I've always wanted to be. And, and then you realize that there's, there's absolutely no top to the mountain whatsoever. Um, and I listened to, you know, Dave Chang and, and Joy Beef guys and, and everyone say the exact same thing for how much mm. they've achieved, you know, that everyone just says there's no, there's no end. Um, and I, I think that by, you know, making the decision, I was there for, for the best part of a couple of years and, um, making the decision to get away from that and to um, get out and see basically as much of the polar opposite as possible was incredibly important. Um, but also just as I've changed within myself, I think that now my mentality is, is everything is about breadth and it's about getting as, as broad a foundation as humanly possible. Um, that there's no such thing as going up, there's just going out. And I think if you focus on making your platform as, as big for everybody else as possible, you know, the next thing you know, you, you've already climbed three steps before you've even blinked. You know, you, you didn't even mm. realize. So um, that's really been the, the shift in my mentality. Um, and uh, now, I mean, I, I actually studied um, teaching at uni before I got into the kitchen initially. Um, and, and the teaching aspect of cooking has always been a huge draw for me. Um, and that's something now that I, I put so much of my focus on is is wanting to keep working with the same people and trying to have them feel the way that I feel when I cook because um, you know there's there's nothing like it in the world for me so I, I want to share that with as many people as I can. When you were reflect, reflecting on your time at the greenhouse, you used the word here a couple of times, and that's because mm. you're housed in the the building that used to be the greenhouse. Can you tell us how? You got that site for the humble onion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I um, and I, I need to stop doing that because um, it's it's <laughs> obviously it's uh, it's not anymore. But um, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I'm actually sat in the dining room, um, and I haven't really spent a great deal of time sat out here for a, for a while. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. So, um, I said I was making the videos um, for the humble onion channel because I, I sort of have a bit of a, um, I don't know, hyperactive, um, creative thing where I, I just sort of don't like to stop making things. But um, so if I couldn't be in the kitchen, I had to put that energy somewhere. Um, so uh, ma making the videos and, and doing those things. And then um, this venue uh, has changed hands a couple of times and um, was running as a, a cafe under the Fiori brand. Um, a person that had worked years ago, he was a, a rep um, that used to come into Cantina um, when I was working there. He was a cheese rep then, um, was working for the company now. And so when, they were, when the place wasn't doing so well here, um, he showed them my videos and he was like, look, I, I've known this guy for a few years and, um, you know, check out his stuff and see what you think. And, and if you want, he can have a meeting. Um, but just to discuss the idea that I would do a residency in the kitchen mm. and they would keep operating the cafe as it was. Um, so I, he's, he pitched me that idea as well. And I sort of wasn't, wasn't initially very excited, but, um, I always have this thing of like, it's, it's always worth a chat. That's sort of my, the thing I tell myself all the time, like just hear, hear people out. Um, so, uh, so I met them in the morning for a coffee and, um, it was probably about halfway through the meeting with the CEO, um, that I think he maybe noticed that I wasn't 
quite the usual thing that he was expecting, possibly, or <laughs> wasn't um, wasn't um, typical of the interactions he'd had with chefs in the past, let's say. Um, and uh, and he was like, you know, would you would you consider taking over the whole space? Um, and inside, obviously, I was I was moving very quickly, but on the surface, I was <laughs> trying to stay very calm and just sort of said, yeah, I'll I'll think about that. Yeah, maybe. And then um, we, we had another meeting set for a couple of days later, um, and I went in with a, with a full business proposal with my, my mission and vision statements and my core values for the business and everything laid out for him um, to show that, that I was serious, but also that I would be competent um, you know, to have that kind of business acumen and to, to really push that forward. So it wasn't just I was very worried um, that I'd be seen as just kind of an imposter um, and just some some chef that wants to be the center of attention or something, and hmm. you know, not not for the right reasons. That you know, to to have the opportunity for a business like this, you know, that's been my dream for a very long time. So um, I really wanted to, as always, just just try to over deliver. Um, and um, yeah, he was he was really taken with that, and it just it just kind of snowballed from there. So. Um, yeah, what went from, you know, do you want to come and cook eggs for three months to, um, <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll take all our signage down. You can you can do anything that you want with the place and, and go crazy, you know. So, it's um, yeah, it's, it's been a really crazy couple of months, to say the least. It's been absolutely wild. Well, tell us a bit about the humble onion. What sort of food are you cooking there? What's, what is your food? Sure. Um, I think, man... So um, with, the, with the channel and with um, sort of how I have always been so interested in food, like I'd always be watching, um, remember Yan, like Yan Can Cook and, um, you know, watching um, like Julia Childs or, um, you know, um, Keith Floyd or um, who was like, I guarantee, um, Justin Phillips, um, you know, all these people, they always made food seem very attainable and very much like something that you can you can do if you want to. And there's mm. nothing scary or intimidating about it. Um, and it's something that I always, um, a rhetoric that I always have for my, my chefs is that it's simple, but it's not basic. And I, I think that that's, that's really, really important. So, um, you know, that, that always drew me... Um, and certainly with the videos, that's what I wanted to, to display as well was, you know, I can show you the, the tricks, whether you actually want to apply the knowledge is your business, you know, whether you actually want to practice this a thousand times and get good at it is up to you, but I'll show you how it works. Um, because I, I truly believe that everyone can cook and that everyone is connected to food. Um, so, you know, when it comes to making my own food, there's not really in my mind a, a very strict hierarchy um, when it comes to ingredients. I, I put as much value into all of them as I possibly can. It's why I've always had kind of a bugbear with truffle dinners and people that just take their normal menu and cover it in truffle and tell you it's a better menu now. Um, <laughs> that always just really shits me. Um, you know, it's, I think, so the, the idea with this is really that I, I want to take the, I don't want to use the word humble, but the, um, the, the modest, humble food of, of my upbringing and my youth mm. um, that I'm sure a lot of people have a similar grounding in and, and show that it's not, it's not bad food. It's just that um, the general, you know, the normal sausages that you get for argument's sake um, are highly processed and you don't know what's in them. You know, whereas mine are just full of Berkshire pork and a lot of time and, and you know, the bays that are, the bay trees that are still outside the venue from the greenhouse days, mm. um, you know, and I, it's just that I choose to hang them and, and ferment them and then smoke them and, and treat them really well. But when they come out to you, it's it's just a, a sausage with some fresh corn polenta and some pepperonata because that's how I like to eat. Mm. Um, so it's, it's certainly not, I, I don't want to say trying to elevate or, you know, gourmet, um, you know, <laughs> simple food or anything. <laughs> Um, because there are lots of people out there that do a, a, a wonderful example of the same sort of things. Um, but there's just no, it's, there's no hidden stuff. It, it's not a mystery. Um, it's, it's just effort. That's all. Um, so yeah, you could say it's modern Australian or you could say it was bistro, um, <laughs> gastro pub-esque or I, I don't really know. It's, it's, it's quite difficult at this stage for me to put a name on it. 
which makes me really happy because if I could, I'd feel like I was doing something that someone else had already done. Hmm. Um, so I like the fact that I just look at it and just see my food. Um, and then the, the putting in a box really is, is other people's prerogative, I think. <laughs> Mine is to keep it as out of the box as I can. You've got many friends in the industry over there. Have you had any conversations? And do you know what the general feeling is in the industry at the moment about the current lockdown? Um, look, I mean, you know, in the, the chats I've had with a few people just over the last um, 12 or 15 hours, um, you know, everyone, I think most people are pretty positive um, in that it's a very preemptive measure at this stage. Um, mm. You know, and, and as I say, we, we acted very quickly last time, broke the stake down into sections and stopped people from moving straight away. And, you know, those sort of things were very swift and, and we got through it um, very quickly as well. So whilst, you know, no one enjoys, we were just sort of getting back to a stage of normalcy and, and people were really starting to, you know, um, yeah, just, just get out and start doing things again. Um, so that's certainly not a good feeling. But at the same time, you know, more prep and more sleep and, and more planning and, and those things are never a bad thing. So, you know, I think um, most people are feeling pretty positive. Well, hopefully you're only a week away from opening. Um, all that energy and adrenaline that you said you were holding on to, that'll build up again. What, what's it going to feel like when you finally get to open the doors of your own venue? Oh, well, unfortunately, I wish I could tell you um, <laughs> because uh, that's uh, sort, of a, sort of a big thing. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm hoping – yeah, I, I have no idea. I think it's, it's going to be a lot of pride and, um, you know, I'm very excited. And, and not just for myself. I think it's for, um, you know, my, my sous chef that I have here was working with me at, at the last venue. We are working there together. Um, and he's come over to continue working with me, and that that feels incredible um, to know that he believes in in what we're doing so so strongly. And you know the there's the floor staff that we've known for for a long time as well. And you know it's it's very much um, everyone coming together for this thing. Um, mm -hmm. We wouldn't have got this put together this quickly at all without our families um, who've been in you know every day working with us. It's it's just crazy the the amount of work they've done. Um, so, you know, I, I want it to be a success for them. You know, I really want it to be good for, for all of them because I just want to make them proud of, of what they've contributed to, you know. Um, so I think there'll be a feeling of relief and I'm sure there'll be a feeling of, of pressure as well because that's just life, you know. There's, there's never a re an action without a reaction. There's always a negative to the positive. But, um, you know, they're, they're really, really great problems to have because, Hopefully we're, we're just too busy and, and running around too fast and, and all those things that, that you really want from your first menu. Well, Chris, having watched some of your uh, cooking videos online, your energy is intoxicating and I'm sure the venue is <laughs> going to be a ripper when you do open the doors. Uh, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds, mate. Please keep in touch and good luck over there and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much, Huck. It's wonderful to speak to you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>